Okay, and so it's time for part two of attribution theory, Kelly's attribution theory. And as I said, uh, we had, and I need a pen, there we go. Uh, we had Fritz Heider, and Heider, you know, started attribution theory and then left. And so we needed to wait until Kelly and Jones and Davis came around for it to continue. So let's start with Kelly and his wildly successful attribution theory. Uh, there's Harold Kelly down there. He was already a famous social psychologist uh, before he turned to attribution theory. He picked up Heider's book and took what Heider was talking about and uh, developed into a more formal experimental theory. Uh, and so Kelly's attribution theory basically states that people uh, you know, attribute the cause of other people's behavior to either internal or external factors. And what's going on is Kelly is taking the philosophical and very wide-ranging uh, inexact work that Heider did and he's really nailing it down so it can be very specific and we can talk about it very specifically in terms of uh, experiments and predicting behavior. So he's saying that the whole attribution process uh, comes down to this. People want to make either an internal or an external attribution uh, for a person's behavior. So you see somebody behave, and you want to either attribute that behavior to something internal, that is, it's caused by something inside the person, or something external, something that was caused by the situation. And uh, Kelly used the term situation or traits or disposition. Uh, however, I really like the term that the difference between something that's internal or external uh, is something that is within the skin, is internal. Any cause of a behavior that resides within somebody's skin is internal. Anything that resides outside is external. And we'll talk about that uh, in live class or uh, the synchronous class. So let's get to the main part of his theory, uh, the covariation theory. So uh, he said that we have to use these uh, three pieces of information in order to make an attribution and attribute the cause as internal or external. So the first piece is uh, information about some type of uh, person and their behavior is consensus. Uh, consensus uh, you know, that's the, you know, he's using it in the vernacular, meaning consensus as in popular. And he's using this to indicate that we're interested in the extent that others behave in the same way towards the stimulus as the target person. So we're looking at this target person and we're saying, okay, so he's behaving in a certain way towards the stimulus. Uh, I, you know, like my cat. And so now uh, consensus information would be, what do other people feel about my cat? Do they like my cat? Uh, another way of describing consensus information is ask ourselves, is this behavior unique to the person? If it's unique, it's not consensual. And according to Kelly, we're going to categorize these three types of information as either low or high. So if you see me playing with my cat and enjoying it, and then you see other people uh, playing with my cat, uh, that's certainly a consensual behavior. The behavior is not unique, so that is a high level of consensus. Consistency, uh, as the uh, vernacular term, the extent to the, uh, which the person always behaves this way towards the stimulus. So you see me petting my cat, uh, you want to know if this behavior is unique to this one situation. So you observe me in other situations and you see that I play and pet with my cat all the time. And so this would be a highly consistent behavior and it would be a high level of consistency. Uh, and then finally distinctiveness. And there's a twist involved but it does follow the vernacular use of the word. The extent to which the person responds in the same way towards different stimuli. So you see me pet my cat, the cat is a stimuli, so how do I respond to other people's cats? And if I don't really interact with other people's cats and stay away from them, uh, then 
that behavior is very distinct. And so that's a high level of distinctiveness. Uh, is this behavior unique to the stimulus? Well, yes it is, so that's high. But if there's a situation where, uh, another situation where uh, you see me and I am going up to every cat I see and petting it, that's low distinctiveness because that behavior of mine, the original behavior of petting my cat, that's not very distinct. It's you know, indistinct, actually. So first off, we need to have these uh, three pieces of information to make an attribution. Then we have to apply uh, these uh, two different rules using the information to make an attribution. So uh, first off, when consensus is low, consistency is high, and distinctiveness is low, we should make an internal attribution. So low, high, low, internal attribution. So for example, let's say that you observe somebody at the uh, you know, at a restaurant and they're complaining about the food, uh, that's a behavior you want to know why. Uh, so you look around for consist, uh, cons consensus information and you see no one else is complaining. Well, that's a low level of consensus information. Uh, you look around and you see that this person complains always in this restaurant. You were here last week and saw them complaining. You were here two weeks ago and saw them complaining. So that's a consistent behavior, so consistency is high. And this, ba uh, this person also complains in other settings, like they complain at the registrar's office and the bursar's office. So their distinctiveness in complaining at the restaurant is low. And whenever you have this constellation of hot, low, high, low, you make an internal attribution. Okay, so what about when you make an external attribution? So in this other situation, you see somebody else complaining about the food at the restaurant, uh, and you start to collect information. You notice that other people also complain. Uh, you know, the food is really bad and everybody's upset about it. So since everybody is upset about it cons and complains, the consensus level is high. Uh, this person always complains uh, in this restaurant. You know this from last week and you know that from the week before. So consistency is high. And then uh, you know that this person doesn't complain in other situations. Uh, you know, for example, that uh, they accept what happens in the registrar's office. They, you know, they're brave about it. They keep a stiff upper lip. So their complaining uh, behavior in this situation is very distinct. Distinctiveness is high. High, 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 and external attribution. She complains because the restaurant is terrible. That is, what's the cause of her complaining behavior? Well, it's outside of her skin. The restaurant is really bad. What's the cause of her complaining behavior? Uh, it's inside of her skin. Uh, she just is somebody who is difficult to please. That's her personality. And personality resides within the skin. Let's go through another example. Uh, Betsy says that it's impossible for her to work with Winky. No one else complains about working with Winky. Betsy always complains about uh, you know, uh, Winky being difficult. Betsy complains about working with Carol, Vicky, and Sean. Okay, so that's the situation. Uh, you want to stop the video and think about what's the uh, you know, consensus information there. And so once you think you have it, uh, you know, uh, start it again. So uh, consensus information, no one else. So what do other people do? Uh, that's consensus information. And no one else, that is non-consensual, so that is low. Uh, now look for the uh, you know, consist consistency information. Stop the video. And uh, Betsy always complains, so we're talking here about uh, consistency. And always is a high level, that is, she's consistent. And uh, stop it now and look for the distinctive, distinctiveness information. And 
Betsy complains about working with Carol, Vicky, and Shanzo. These are other situations, and in these other situations, her behavior is uh, the same. So she's not really that distinct. So her distinctiveness is low. And then now, what's the attribution we make with low, high, low? That's right. It's an internal attribution. It's something inside of her skin. Uh, Betsy is just a difficult person to work with. Or Betsy is not happy with anybody. That's her personality. Personality is within the skin. Okay, and I spell it out here. Now let's change this to an external attribution. And, you know, it's the same behavior. Betsy says it's impossible to work with Winky. Uh, however, consensus has to be high, so Carol, Anne, and Vicky complain about working with Winky also. Uh, consistency has to be high, so nothing changes here and distinctiveness needs to be high so her behavior has to be distinct and Betsy now enjoys working with Carol, Vicki, and Sean. In fact, uh, she only dislikes working with Winky so that's very distinct and that's high and so it's an external attribution. Uh, Betsy gets along with everybody but she's always disliked uh, Winky uh, and so probably it's something about Winky Winky's hard to work with. That's external, something outside of Betsy's skin. You may have noticed that uh, consistency is always high. Uh, what happens when it's low? What attributions do you make? Uh, that's a situation where your attributions are uncertain. And different psychologists explain what will happen next. Sometimes you will not make an attribution or you may make an attribution to the specific situation and not to the person uh, or you know the, the combination of the person and the situation or you may be intrigued by the situation and you'll observe this situation and give it some attention to try to find the answer to the consistency riddle. Also, what happens if you don't have any information? That is, you need to observe things over a time period and you need to look at different things to get consistent uh, consensus, distinctiveness, and consistency information. What happens if you don't have those over time and those other sources of information? Well, Kelly says that you're able to make one-shot attributions in certain situations. Uh, and what he calls the, at, the augmentation and the discounting principle apply to those situations. Uh, the augmentation principle applies to situations where an uh, actor is in a situation and they're doing something. However, there's an inhibitory external cause present. And because there's something inhibiting the person from doing this, uh, we will augment or increase the strength of our attribution of their internal cause. So let's say I really love the Brooklyn Bagel Company and I love their bagels. Okay, so you make an attribution, internal attribution to me saying, well, yeah, he likes, the, he likes those Brooklyn Bagels, but uh, I have to go all the way outside of the story to get it. Well, the travel is something that inhibits that behavior and is external. So you say, well, if you have to travel that hard, that far, he must really like these bagels. And so you augment how much I like the bagels. The discounting principle uh, is when there is a facilitating external cause, uh, we, it will make us discount or weaken the strength of the internal cause. And so I say something like, well, you know, I have Starbucks coffee every day. And you make the internal attribution, well, you must like Starbucks. But then I say, uh, you know, and Starbucks is the only coffee shop between here, my house, and the subway, and between the subway and York. 
Uh, and so, of course, that means that uh, you know, I have several opportunities to stop and get Starbucks, and I'd have to go out of my way to get something else. So we say, well, yeah, he may like Starbucks, but probably not as much as I thought before. So that's how you'd use augmentation and discounting principles. And, uh, oh, I forgot to erase this from the last, from two slides ago. Uh, Kelly's theory has been very, very successful successful over time and uh, there's been several offshoots of Kelly's theory uh, one area is in motivation and uh, today whenever we talk about motivation we talk about not just uh, consistent con consensus distinctiveness and consistent consistency ugh, uh, but stability controllability and globality as the sources of information that we use to make uh, Kellyan attributions about a person's motivation. And people's motivations follow those rules almost perfectly. Uh, and we also have applied Kelly's theory to depression. And indeed, uh, based on the attributions people make, they become depressed or not depressed. And fortunately, then we can use Kelly's theory to actually train people to make different attributions which will help relieve their depression and also make different attributions which may motivate them if they are not motivated. So that's very, very interesting. No, I don't want a highlighter. Where's my pen? There we go. Uh, beyond Kelly's theory, uh, Kelly uh, presented an attribution theory that describes an ideal situation or an ideal way in which people make attributions, and it's a very, very logical way. Well, uh, Heider very, very distinctively mentioned that there should be errors in the uh, attributional process. And so Kelly's theory kind of like sidesteps side this whole issue of the errors. Uh, but since uh, Kelly's theory was published, other researchers have investigated some of these errors, these attri attributional errors or attributional biases. And here's some interesting ones. The self-serving bias, uh, that is, I, you know, the actor, will make internal attributions for their own successes and then the actor will generally make external attributions for failures. So let's say that on our first exam you get an A. Well, that's a success. So you make an internal attribution, I'm smart, or I'm, I work hard and I study hard. Uh, those are all inside the skin. And so those are the internal attributions you make for success. But let's say, God forbid, you don't do well, you fail on the exam. Uh, then the attributions you would tend to make are things such as, uh, well, Dr. Ashton didn't prepare us for the exam, external. Uh, the exam was too hard, external. Uh, I was sick, external. Uh, so these are all things outside of the skin. Even having a cold is kind of outside of the skin. It's an external thing that comes into you. But these are all external attributions people would make for their failures. And we do this to protect our self-esteem, to uh, protect our ego. The false consensus effect, and there we see consensus, a term we've been throwing around in Kelly's theory, uh, is that people see their own behavioral choices and your judgments as relatively common and appropriate to the existing circumstances. That is, they erroneously see what they do as uh, consensual that is supported and agreed upon by other people when it's really not. So, uh, do you support AOC, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? Uh, if you say yes, you're going to overestimate the number of your peers who say yes also. That's the false consensus effect. And the actor-observer bi bias is very interesting. Uh, it's when we're making attributions about ourselves and we're making attributions about other people, actors and observers. 
uh, when I'm making attributions about my own behavior, I generally tend to make, you know, people generally tend to make external attributions about their own behavior above and beyond anything else I've talked about up here. So uh, that is, uh, you know, I pass an exam. Why did I do that? Uh, because the exam was really easy. Uh, however, somebody else passes it. Well, that person is really smart. A uh, classic, uh, you know, that's an internal attribution. A classic, uh, you know, phrase to describe this is that uh, I was pushed and you tripped. That is, if uh, we fall down, I would make the attribution that something external pushed me down. Somebody pushed me or uh, I tripped over a rug or something external. But then if I see you fall the same way, I'd say you're just clumsy, you tripped. Uh, and this bias really comes from perception in that if you think about it, I am looking at all, you know, the things that I'm looking at in my visual field are external causes of my behavior. And so I'm very much focused on things that are external to me that I'm responding to. And so it's just very natural for me to assume that what I'm responding to is causing my behavior. And that's why I make these external attributions. However, when I look at you and other people doing things, uh, I don't see things from your perspective. I see you as one thing in this environment. And I see you moving around the environment. Oftentimes, you're the major thing in the environment. And so because you're the major thing, because you seem to be in control of things, I will make an internal attribution that is, you're doing this because you want to or because of some internal cause. Uh, and then finally, we have the big one, the fundamental attribution error. And that is so big, that's in part three or our final uh, section. However, I want to point out while we're here that the fundamental attribution error is just uh, the uh, other's behavior part of the actor observer bias. All right, so I'll see you in part three.